A missing child. A bomb disguised as a Christmas gift. A civil rights era Klan murderer brought to justice. Join David Ridgen as he and victims' family members track down leads, speak to suspects, and search for answers in the CBC's hit cold case podcast, Someone Knows Something. Subscribe to SKS wherever you get your podcasts. This is a CBC Podcast. Dante, Anin, Buju, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Cancelled tours, postponed shows and sudden loss of income. Musicians would normally be busy with summer concert dates, but because of COVID-19, they now have very quiet schedules. But many artists are coming up with new ways to make music and share it with their fans. This week on Unreserved, we're talking to musicians from their home studios to find out how they're keeping busy. With everything from audio samples crowdsourced from fans to a David Bowie cover in honor of frontline workers. A major health scare in late February halted some of hip-hop artist Frank Wald's plans to tour around the U.S. and Canada in the spring. And even though he recovered, COVID-19 meant he had to cancel or postpone the rest of his shows for the foreseeable future. That meant Frank needed to find new ways to provide for himself and his family. He is Sichang Hu Lakota from the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. He joins us from Chicago. Hello, Frank. Hello, Rosanna. It's a pleasure to be on the show. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you on. So first of all, what happened to you back in February? So I ended up having um, a stress-induced seizure. You know, it takes a lot of work to be an independent artist. Um, To be an independent artist in the U.S., you know, we're dealing with a level of invisibility and lack of opportunity. So, you know, I manage myself. I produce and engineer my own music. So it just takes a lot of work to do what I do. And, you know, for the first time in my life, I I, had hit a limit physically, and I ended up having a first ever stress-induced seizure of my life and I I got taken by ambulance to a a hospital on the south side of Chicago close to where I'm based and ended up actually having one of the worst uh, experiences of medical racism I've ever faced in my life as a native person so uh, the hospital had assumed I was I was on hard drugs PCP and that's what had caused the seizure and caused my state. Um, even though relatives were there telling them otherwise, you know, they just assumed the worst. They saw my uh, ceremony scars because I'm Lakota and we do some piercing ceremonies. They saw some, some of the ceremony scars on my body and had assumed it was self-mutilation. And then I had come to in the hospital and I was intubated and I wasn't supposed to be conscious, but I ended up coming to out of the sedatives and I, I panicked and freaked out. I felt like I was suffocating and they marked me with combative disorder and strapped me into a bed with locked restraints for a couple days and so I went in for a seizure and when I came to a couple days later and came out of it um, I actually ended up having to stay in the hospital for a whole week to undo the damage that they had done to my muscles and my body from shooting me with so many sedatives and from strapping me into a bed like I, I felt like and looked like I got ran over by a truck so so yeah it was just it was a really uh, violent experience for me I came out of that just just a couple weeks before the pandemic hit so you know I was kind of kind of in a sense of recovery already and then um, you know we all got thrown into a tailspin after that Mm -hmm. and how did you process that did you put that into your music yeah, you know, it, it's uh, it was the only thing I knew how to do. So, you know, uh, my music journey started when I was a very young boy, and I started playing music and writing songs to heal and process my world and process my experiences. And and so, you know, to this day, I'm still doing that. So I came out of that um, with just a lot of trauma, even spiritual, emotional, physical, like I had never really suffered before all at once. And it was a little overwhelming. And so I, I did what I what I knew how to do, and I turned to my music. I'm working on a project right now, an album that I'm dedicating to my mother. It's called Ina, which is the Lakota word for mother. And uh, a lot of songs were were born out of that experience. But also what was born out of that experience is my first ever flute album I'm also going to release this month. It's called uh, Mm. Alowan Wetu, which is the Lakota phrasing for spring song. So so I composed four songs after that experience because... You know, I'm not fluent in my language, Lakota, I'm learning. And so I really only speak English, and English just doesn't capture sometimes what I feel. And 
Um, I found that when I just put it all into, you know, uh, native flute, which is one of the instruments I play, because I also produce music, I, but I've never really put out an, an, an album as just a musician, purely music. And so I, I kind of turned to that because it was the only thing I could do to express, you know, a lot of what I was feeling out of that experience. And so I, I went outside and recorded these songs outside just before the pandemic hit and just before we went into lockdown and recorded a lot of the songs on my home reservation outside of the house that I grew up in. So I'm I'm looking forward to releasing uh, those two projects soon here. And like I said, they were born out of that experience. Music has always been a tool for me to heal, a tool for me to process. And I'm very fortunate to be able to share that process and that healing with people through music. So when you say that you you use music to process the experience, what kinds of, um, and the flute, which is really beautiful, How what kinds of lyrics did you find yourself writing and what kind of... Um, you know, genre did you play in for this album? Yeah, so so um, so the, the album that I'm dedicating to my mother, Ina, is going to be everything mm. from hip hop to some acoustic hip hop because um, I also play, you know, several acoustic instruments. But the the native flute album, Olo Wetu, is actually the music is just purely native flute. And, and I'll give you an mm. example. One of the songs on there is uh, called "Calling Your Spirit Back" song, and that was rooted out of a a. Uh, just um, a Lakota teaching we have of calling your spirit back. You know, um, it's a daily practice. But especially if you go through something traumatic, we're taught to call your spirit back because your spirit can leave you even in fraction or pieces. You know, and so when I came out of the hospital, I really felt like my spirit had left me, and so mm. um, I felt like I needed to do more than just call my spirit back in the traditional sense. I felt like I needed to write a song to do that, and never have I ever had a song just be in my head and it was in its entirety. And that's how this song. Came came to me I picked up my flute as soon as I got home I stepped outside and um, what you hear on the album is what came out the first time I played it and that's never happened before you know usually I have to work on songs sometimes I'll, I'll tweak songs for months sometimes years but this song was already there I, you know and, and that, that'll give you an example of the, the type of songs that are on this album but I also am recording uh, the stories of how these songs were born in English so sort of what I'm doing here I kind of shared the experience that 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 birthed that song Song. So with each song, I'm going to also share the story of where it came from. And, and doing that, you know, I, I, it's kind of a Lakota thing, too. And in a lot of indigenous cultures, they kind of share the story of where the song came from before they share it. So I hope to do that with, with some of my upcoming projects as well, because I think the stories are also just as important as the music. So really, you haven't slowed down at all since <laughs> since your recovery. It sounds no, no, like no, no, not at all. I think uh, you know, I, I just had to get creative in how I how I kept going. But you know, fortunately, I I am doing my passion. I'm doing what I love, and I'm very blessed to do what I love, even if it is stressful and a lot of work. But every day I wake up and get to play music and make a living off of music. I feel like I'm living my dream. You know. Hmm. And you're not just working on on your own music. You're also sort of rippling out this this idea of community many others and you know indian country as well as yourself are feeling these uh these effects what specifically are you doing to help communities through this pandemic um definitely so i'm I'm a part of this uh collective this this artist collective of uh, young indigenous artists around my age um we're called the dream warriors and we actually formed just out of necessity and need um we were looking for management for young indigenous artists, just like a, you know, some sort of network or support system for us to find gigs and kind of create a support system for each other. And we, we couldn't really find one that already existed. So we just banded together as as peers and as relatives and, and, and created an artist collective. So we really use this collective as a, a vehicle to create support and systems for native artists that weren't there for us. And one of the ways we've been able to do that in this pandemic is uh, webinars. So we, we we so far have done two webinars where we ended up raising over several thousand dollars um, in, in these webinars to disperse to Native families in need. And we put out a call and we had over hundreds of Native families across the reservations we come from and also communities beyond the communities we come from requesting assistance, financial need. And, you know, I, I don't know if y'all are paying attention to the news and stats coming out of the states, but Native communities are being left out of a lot of the statistics and the numbers 
being recorded about how um, this pandemic is affecting communities. So we're left out of a lot of funding as well. So it was really great mm-hmm. to be able to use our collective energy and our art to 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 um, do these webinars to generate you know thousands of dollars worth of funding to disperse to hundreds of families in need. And we also had um, donors match some of the funding. So this was this is only the beginning for us in, in, in this sort of um, this this uh, new creative way of of helping our communities and using what we love to do that. That's amazing. Thank you for being such a wonderful, bright light in your community. Thank you, Rosanna. I appreciate it. Frank Wall is a Sachanghu Lakota rapper from the Rosebud Indian Reservation in South Dakota. His new album will be out later this summer. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild, talking all about how musicians are entertaining themselves during self-isolation. Greenlandic electronic music producer Akulak Bollison was bored at home, stuck because of the pandemic. So to keep himself busy, he wanted to make a new song, with a little help from his Twitter friends. My name is Akalu Battleson, and I'm born and raised in Nuuk and also in North Greenland, a place called Umanok. Yeah, I'm a music producer, beat maker, songwriter, and I make memes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I do a lot of stuff. Yeah, I was supposed to travel around the world uh, doing DJ gigs, but uh, because of the virus, I'm stuck in my home, so I had to figure something out. So I asked my Twitter followers what kind of sounds they could make. (laughs) And I had 27 submissions of sounds that I could uh, make music with, and I did so. There were a lot of these these kind of sounds, and uh, they were easy to make it work uh, with uh, within my program and within electronic music because you can pitch uh, them down, and it's uh, suddenly a, a kick sound like, mm. and uh, it works really great. It, yeah, also, uh, the kick and snare sounds are made of this sound. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I did it during a stream on Twitch, so they could follow what I could uh, do with their sounds. And I, it, was, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was a good experience with my followers. I've been sitting in front of a computer since uh, late 90s, in 1998, I think, when I got my first computer. When I started doing uh, music, I started with a computer and a guitar. You just plug it into the uh, computer and you could make sounds. You could record record into the computer. And it was uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, I got hooked doing music. I tend to make my music more electronic. What I do for myself is I make house music mostly. Well, I call it iklu music because iklu means house. I just like that 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 pumping kick that goes throughout and I can mix in a lot of stuff, uh, make a kind of a cohesive set. So I've been doing that, this kind of workflow for 20 years now. And uh, now, basically, I can make any sound sound like any other sound. (laughs) Okay, if you look at sound waves, sound waves go up and down. And how fast it goes, it creates, uh, that's what it creates, the pitch of the sound. And I can take a sound and take a small bit of one sound and make it loop. So it goes back and forth, back and forth. 
if I can make the loop faster, that's what creates the pitch. It goes higher in pitch. If I make it slower, it goes lower in pitch. So in that way, I can manipulate the the, the tones. Uh, so I can put it. I can play with the sound with a keyboard. One of the interesting sounds from this beat is definitely the bass, because uh, my friend Vinny, he's making the sound with his nose, but it's inside of his nose. I don't know how he does it, but uh, you can take a listen. <laughs> yeah, that's my friend Vinny, but I put it through some effects so I can turn the, them off and so I can hear how it sounds. That's my friend Vinny. That's a keyboard. I can... Yeah. And I took the sound and made it into a bass. So it's here. In context, it goes like this. Yeah, that's my friend Vinny, that's a bass. Well, I guess uh, the quarantine time was uh, the thing that made me play with the idea of uh, working with sounds that uh, my Twitter followers submitted. Yeah, mostly were Inuit, but there were also other natives from s south. I like uh, connecting dots in our communities. And it was a good way to yeah connect the dots and have a sense of community, even though we're so far away. Yeah. And people felt that. People felt that they were coming all together and make this song together. And uh, it was a good feeling. That was Akalu Balasin. You can find the song on SoundCloud and a bunch of his other music under the artist's name Uyarak or on our website at cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Hearing all about how musicians are keeping themselves entertained during this time of cancelled shows and tour dates, electro synth pop artist Wolf Saga recently released a cover of David Bowie's 1977 song Heroes. The London, Ontario based musician wanted to honor frontline workers from healthcare providers to grocery store clerks who continue to work during the COVID 19 pandemic. Singer and keyboardist Johnny Saga worked with guitarist Richard Gracious and drummer Danny Miles of July Talk for the song. For Johnny Saga, the song also carries a personal connection to his own hero. Johnny joins me from Toronto. Welcome, Johnny. Hey, how's it going? Good, good. So why did you want to record Bowie's song, Heroes? There's a couple of reasons. The first being a tribute and honoring those frontline workers and, and, you know, the real heroes of this pandemic that are that are keeping these essential services open for, for people. You know, me, me and the guys, when we were initially recording this and swapping ideas, we, we, we definitely discussed that we wanted to do something for them. And... It definitely shows in the song and the recording, and I really nailed it. And this, the, the other reason, that, as you were saying, the more personal, is uh, my late father uh, is also named Johnny, 
John Sr. He passed of cancer last summer in July. We were big Bowie fans, you know. I think that's the whole reason why I even started listening to, you know, synth- synthesizers and, and pop music. When he passed away in hospice, they when they carried his body out, they asked my my stepmother what what song they'd like to play, and you know she she really didn't know what to do, and she 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 texted me and asked me, and the first song that came to my mind was Heroes, you know, so the, that's what he was carried out to, and I I thought it was such a su- suiting song, fitting song for him because he he loved he loved that song, and you know he was my hero, so mm. it's a little tribute to him as well. Yeah. In what other ways was he your hero besides, of course, the all-important Bowie worshipping? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just, you know, he, he was he was my biggest fan. I remember when I started uh, dabbling with the electronic music and stuff, uh, I was in school at the time, college, and I remember him sort of saying, you know, don't let this take over, you know, your your life and stuff. You know, you still have to find something to do just because you know music and, and art it's not it's not always the most promising money maker i'm sure you guys know that so mm-hmm. you know he it's funny because he started out saying you know don't really let the you know this stuff get it take over and and then you know when i started to see some success you know it really turned turn around to him saying you know you can never stop <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta make music and you gotta keep doing this so i think he was just always championing me you know it was always nice to have him in my corner there root me on. Oh. So clearly a big influence in your life. In what ways is he uh, still in your life? You know, he's, he's here every day, uh, both, you know, spiritually and, and physically. Uh, actually, above my, my little studio set up, uh, the computer and, and things, I have uh, his ashes are hanging here in a bag. So, you know, he's still overseeing all the projects and things that I'm working on so he can you know, make sure things are sounding good, I guess. He's here, in, you know, every day and every choice, uh, everything I do, you know, I can I can hear him in there saying, like, you know, critiquing things and, you know, being a dad. So I think that's, that's really, it's really humbling and, and, and I'm very grateful that I can still sort of have this relationship through him, through my music. I think that's, that's you know, I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Mm. So in regards to the song Heroes, how were you able to record and produce this song from home? So I have a little home studio set up here in, in my apartment. So I mean, it, it's really been no problem to, to work on things still and keep that going. Uh, I guess the challenging part was was working with people who weren't in the same room and getting Richard and, and Danny to sort of send me files and you know jump on FaceTime and, and things to talk about certain parts of the song that we wanted to change or what we wanted to do. I think that was a learning curve and it really was nice though to, to, to have the collaboration and, you know, I cranked it out in a week or something. Wow. So what did recording um, this song and releasing it into the world feel like for you? Oh, it's, it feels awesome. Since I started uh, Wolf Saga, I wanted to, I've always wanted to cover a, Bo- a Bowie song and I think this is, was such a perfect time to, to do so, especially with this song. And I hope people really, uh, relate to it and, and you know let it let it be their song and get them through whatever whatever they have to get through these days during this unfortunate pandemic yeah i'm, I'm overjoyed i don't, I, 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 I'm, can't, I can't explain it it's just it feels great you know mm-hmm. it's a really funky version what do you think david bowie would think of your cover i think da- i think david would like it it, it borrows en- uh, enough from the the original to to pay homage and then you know i sort of do my thing with it which i think is what he would have love to hear so i think he would he would have liked it for sure i agree (laughs) and perhaps even more importantly what do you think your father would think of the cover oh he'd love it he'd be he'd be playing it on repeat he'd be spamming it on facebook he'd yeah he he i know he'd love it he's like not because not because he always loved everything i did but i just think i i really yeah he would have really enjoyed this would have said it was excellent that's what he always said (laughs) <laughs> thank you so much for your time today, Johnny. Yeah, no, thank you. That was Johnny Saga of Wolf Saga. That cover of David Bowie's Heroes is available on Spotify. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Three years ago, Chalkdown musician Samantha Crane thought she might never be able to play guitar again. But in July, she'll release her new record, a small death. 
Over the past few weeks, she's put out a series of singles leading up to that release with praise from the New York Times and NPR already. Samantha joins me from Oklahoma. Hello, Samantha. Hi, thank you for having me. So take me back to three years ago. What happened that made you think you might not ever play again? Well, it was sort of a uh, complicated mix of um, events that happened. I've struggled with tendonitis and carpal tunnel for a while now. And right after my last album came out in 2017, I was really struggling with a lot of uh, mental health issues. And then my carpal tunnel and my tendonitis was just at an all-time high rate of just pain. And then around that time, I also got into three car wrecks back to back all within sort of the period of two or two and a half, three months. And just to be clear, I am not an awful driver. I was in three car wrecks that I was hit um, by other people. It's just one of those like bad things come in threes, I guess. It sort of just turned into this real spiral of panic attacks and depression. And I, I just, I couldn't play at all. It would take, I'd wake up in the morning and it would take a good hour for my for feeling to come back into my hands. And then I, I think that your mind and your soul can have a lot to do with uh, your physical health as well. And so I was just in a really bad sort of way, just kind of relinquished myself to like, well, I guess that part of my life is over and it became really depressing, but it was really good spiritual sort of awakening as well, even though I was trapped in my house um, without much ability to, to do much at the time. Mm-hmm. Carpal tunnel, tendonitis, three car wrecks. That's a lot. That sounds insurmountable. I, I, I'm sure people would not blame you for feeling like you would never return to playing again. How did the, how did the journey back from that begin for you? The more that I, I understood, I think that if I was going to have any sort of semblance of a life again, um, if that couldn't involve music, because I didn't really understand what was going on with me yet, then I needed to find something else to enjoy, I think. And so I really started having to look inside of myself and who I was and what I liked and what I enjoyed about life outside of music and outside of my identity as a musician. And I think as I started looking inward, figuring that out. Walking has been a huge thing for me is just meditative walking. I would go on really long walks, which is where I came up with the ideas for a lot of the songs that ended up being on my new record. But yeah, it was a really slow journey just over the period of about a year and a half. Mm. Was there a turning point where things started to get better in your view? I don't know if it was like a specific moment. I just felt like Eventually, one day I woke up and I was like, oh, my hands are are actually feeling like well enough now that I think I could pick up a guitar if if I wanted to and play for a little bit. But I do remember just kind of it was like that. I just woke up and I went into the kitchen and made myself a cup of coffee. And normally at that point, I would put it in a thermos and then go out on a walk. But instead, I just like put it in a regular mug and sat down at my kitchen table and took my guitar out of its case, which is funny because now I don't, I mean, I never keep my guitar in its case. Like when I'm at home, it sits on a stand where I can just grab it at any time. But at that point in life, it was just in its case because I hadn't touched it for so long. And I took it out and I um, played this song that I really like. um, That's just like really easy for me to remember. I've been playing it since I was probably 18 or 19 years old. It's a song by... Sufjan Stevens called Romulus and I've just always loved that song and it's I just sat down and I played it and then put the guitar back and thought well that felt really nice (laughs) yeah that does sound like it was really nice to finally put your fingers on the guitar strings again Um, and then you started writing this album as I understand Um, much of it was written in the ensuing months what was that like it's almost like a period of convalescence, really, I think of it as. And so during that period, even though I wasn't writing songs, I am a bit of a magpie and I just collect everything that comes into my brain. I write it down or speak it into a voice recorder or something. I just like to mm. to have that for 
poems or painting ideas or or music ideas or whatever. I just like to have kind of a encyclopedia of thoughts of I of projects I could have or or something. So at that I would pull out all my notes that I had been keeping for the past year and a half and start writing. I I've kind of never thought about this before in all of the records that I've made, but something that I realized in making this record is that I don't use songs to process things. I use songs as a cathartic way to move on from things. And that mm-hmm. was something that I noticed just in this is because most of the stuff that I was writing wasn't super down in the dumps or like really, you know, woe was me, like here's all of the trouble I've been through. It had mm-hmm. this twist of this is the trouble that I've been through, but I feel so lucky to be on the other side of that. And I think that's what the record really is. And I think I think if you, you know, I don't feel like it feels like a super sad record. It's melancholy. It is like, does have some, you know, bits of trauma and tragedy in it. But it's really about just the journey that we all go through as, as humans, which is that constantly having to start over again, you know, and you can view that as sad or uh, a shame or something. But I find it to be really reassuring. You can always count on being able to start over again. It's just going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's a beautiful record. Um, do you listen to it now and think, wow, you know, I went through something and this is this is a reflection of um, of my soul's journey in that sense? To me, it feels the most representative of me of any record that I've made. I, it was the first record of mine that I've produced as well. And so that was something that was really important to me because it, it felt so personal. I, I've, I've always been a personal writer, but a lot of records have had songs on there as well that are written you know, from the point of view of another party, like a, a character or something like that. And I like writing songs like that, but there is just this element of sheer vulnerability about the songs on this record, which is just, there's no character involved here. It's just myself. And I am really proud of it. Like, I'm I'm really proud of the fact that I took something that was really difficult to go through and I made a record out of it that I think people will enjoy and be able to relate to. So when listeners finally do get to listen to the whole album, what do you hope they're going to take away from it? I don't know if I really have a preference. I think part of my thing about, you know, releasing music is by the time I've made the record, um, it's sort of not mine anymore. It's, it's, it's everyone else's. I've already done my bit. I've gotten past, this thing that I needed art to get past. Hmm. Well, thank you very much for uh, making this gift and for speaking with us today. It was a real pleasure. Of course, thanks. That was Choctaw singer-songwriter Samantha Crane. Her new record, A Small Death, will be out on July 17th. New music from Samantha Crane, that was Garden Dove. Matawayuhi is a self-described Indian with an education. In 2018, he wrapped that line in a video submission to NPR's Tiny Desk Contest and got a rave review in the contest's honorable mentions. After his 2019 release, Scatterbrain, Mato was set to submit a new Tiny Desk Contest video, but in these unusual times, he had to find a new way to put it together. Let's take a listen to a bit of the final product. That was Mato Uyuhi's entry for NPR's Tiny Desk Contest. Mato is Lakota, and he joins me now to talk about making music with a group in a time of isolation. Welcome to the show, Mato. Yeah, of course. So for those who don't know, what is NPR's Tiny Desk Contest? So NPR, their music department, puts on these Tiny Desk video series at the offices in Washington, D.C., And so they have a wide range of different artists who come into the offices and perform for the staff. 
And so they want to kind of expand that opportunity to show people's performances. And so essentially it's people from around the world and you can submit videos of you playing with, it could be by yourself or with a full band. And essentially the only, you know, stipulation is that you have to be behind a desk and just perform an original song. And so, yeah, in 2018, my band and I did one. And then this past year in 2020, we were, there's more uh, barriers, I guess. And so we had to kind of finagle something new. So normally you're all close together in the same space, which clearly isn't happening right now. So how did you put this year's entry together? It was uh, honestly kind of the same story. Like I, the way I work in terms of creatively, it's, it comes in waves and kind of droves and I have to really, really concentrate and focus. And then it always helps to talk with somebody about it too. And so my buddy, Adam, who has been in both videos now, he plays the trombone. He plays a bunch of different instruments. He's sick. I, we, I was on the phone with him and I was kind of mulling over like, okay, all of my gigs got canceled for basically the rest of the year, as is everyone in the band. And so I was kind of thinking like, what are the different ways that we we could stay performing just in a different way and so i was kind of flirting with the idea i was like yeah we could do a tiny desk video and maybe do like zoom style or something and so we all had i think we did a zoom call me and a couple of the other bandmates and it was so like laggy and the latency was really off and so i was like we, yeah we can't do this and so we we started conceptualizing more and then we kind of thought okay maybe if we just all record ourselves separately and then just track the audio. It'll kind of be the same thing as it was in 2018. We're just not in the same space. That being said, though, it was tough to get the timing right and things like that. Like there was a lot of different cuts of the video where the if the you know the drum is off by a frame, then it's going to sound off by a frame, and the whole video is be- going to become discombobulated. And that those aren't issues that you really have, you know, in a natural setting with a band because you'll just pick that up instantly. But when you're editing a video. It's like, oh, no. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's falling <laughs> apart. So you can get really intense. And just like it's a, it was a lot of RAM. And like I was, you know, thanking the creator for making sure my computer didn't crash or any of that and stuff. So that's the fun part about creativity is I think it's not only about finding solutions. It's also about finding problems. And with this video, there was, yeah, there was a lot of problems to find. Have you gotten any reactions from it thus far? Yeah, NPR featured us again as kind of in their um, sections of like the entries that we love uh, similar to in 2018. I think we were, we were pretty stoked on that, but yeah, overall it's been, it's been good reception. Now you've been pretty busy with uh, music while you're stuck in your home, making tunes and posting them on Instagram and TikTok, um, <laughs> which for us old people is like the newest thing. How has the response been uh, of this kind of um, sharing of your creativity? It's been great. I think naturally I'm a kind of a private person when it comes to my music and making things such as that. And But I think in this time, it's important to, you know, explore new opportunity, new safe opportunities at that. But I think so I, I felt inclined to kind of show people my creative process. And so I'm also interested in sampling and I produce all of my own stuff, but I haven't used a lot of samples in the past. And so I the one rule I had was to only use my mom's old CDs and records that are in the house right now. And so some of those, interestingly enough, have been some indigenous artists. And so it's funny, there's one, actually, I haven't sampled it yet, but it's this, it's this rap group out of Pine Ridge and they're called Native Era. And this was in like 2005, but I looked at the CD and it says like Tumato, like blah, 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 blah. And I was just a kid when I got that. I remember being so like excited because I had no you know, inkling of music or anything, but I was, those were kind of like the first native artists I saw, especially in, since they were Lakota, I was really stoked. But in um, the last sample video, I found this one CD. It was all women's group called Walela. And it turns out to be Rita Coolidge's group that she had back in the nineties. And so I listened to it and there's this amazing old, I don't know if it was one of their elders, but it, it's just a, it's, it's an older woman singing and so i kind of took that and made it into this like indigenous house beat and it was it was really fun for me because i've never made anything like that and i don't sample that often so and it was indigenous so it was just 
kind of a marriage of all these different parts of my identity and just exploring more. So I'm sure your mom loves that you're uh, digging through her record collection, Mato. <laughs> yeah, it brings her back. I think she can like, I get to ask her where she got it from and everything. Oh, that sounds amazing. Um, so no one really knows when live shows will come back. Your tour, as you say, it has been pretty much canceled for the rest of the year or when people will be able to cry around their tiny desks again. How has the pandemic changed the way you approach music? That's a really good question. I think it's allowed me, I, I would imagine a lot of other creators to kind of get, I think, more centered at the root of what we're trying to accomplish in music and what we're trying to express and it's also allowed a lot of patience because, you know, I think when everything is according to plan and we're kind of immersed in a lot of the privileges we have as artists and musicians, it kind of comes, gets really, you know, hectic, especially being in LA too. I love being, I love being there, but it can get, the pressure can really amount in these different spaces. And so I think when you're dormant and you kind of, you're, you're just focused on yourself again, I don't know. It, I, I feel like the music I'm making right now is some of the most, primitive if that makes sense yeah. and kind of spiritual because it's really rooted at like what i want to express really unfiltered and everything like that so yeah it's been cool I've, I've really it's it's not i mean obviously everything isn't it's really devastating right now but i think the silver lining is that just me personally i'm able to kind of get back to what i wanted to express from the jump well thank you for your time today <laughs> yeah of course thank you all and yeah thanks for having me on the show My tongue is nodding. So I loosen up the bell loop on my dungarees. Helps to heal the blood circling, hurtling tons of feet. Healing from memories, peeling the bandages up off my sleeve. Kind of, sort of, adjacent to my aorta's placement. They can't afford my pain. That's Mato Wayuhi, a Lakota musician currently based in South Dakota. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community culture and conversation. This episode was produced by Kyle Musica, Zoe Tennant, Stephanie Cram, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I go say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.